Full house, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to welcome Pat, Pat Capney here to the committee. Um, he's replacing John, John Dallet, uh, who's been here and for a while and has made a very good contributions when he has been here and we wish John well. So you're very welcome, Pat. Thanks very much, sir. Um, um, I want to advise members that the meeting will start in public session to consider the SR on direct payments to farmers, followed by an overview briefing from the Livestock Meat Commission. Uh, we'll then move into closed session to consider the evidence gathered and key issues in respect of the UK Agriculture Bill. Um, okay, so... We are open, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry? We're open, yes. Okay, so I'd like to, the meeting is now declared open to the public and this will be recorded throughout Parliament buildings and online and f for those of you who are in the public gallery, uh, you can use your mobile de devices as long as they're in airplane mode and are muted and the assembly Wi-Fi details are on the chairs. Um, do have any apologies? Ma sorry, Morris has, apo there's an, uh, Morris has apologies but there's... Apart from Morris, everybody else is present. Okay, I want to advise members that last week I will that that, that as I mentioned last week I will likely likely be attending the interparliamentary forum on the 19th of March in the House of Lords with other committee chairs. There is a possibility, with reference to the coronavirus, that the meeting will be cancelled, and uh, Philip uh, will deputise for me at the committee meeting next week uh, if if the meeting still proceeds on ahead in, in London. Uh, the draft minutes. Members, please refer to the draft minutes of the meeting held on 35th of March. They're page 6 to 12 in your packs. And can I seek agreement to sign these minutes? <coughs> great, great. Great. Okay. Uh, okay. So, right now to commence our public session. Um, so, we're looking at uh, the briefing papers for the uh, direct payment to farmers miscellaneous amendment are page 14 to 21 of your packs. I want to advise members the Minister will bring forward a motion to confirm the, this SR in the Assembly on the 16th of March. The Examiner of Statute Rules has advised that she has no issues to report in respect to this SR. I'd like to take this opportunity now to welcome Mark McLean, the Principal Agricultural Economist, uh, Cap Reform, Brexit and Trade Policy Branch, and Carol uh, O'Boyle, uh, Principal Future Partnership Branch. So I'd like to uh, invite you to give um, a 10 minute presentation, after, afterwards, after which members will uh, ask you some questions. So you want to go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think the committee, I'll recall, there was a uh, the Direct Payments to Farmers Legislative Continuity Act, uh, which came into effect on the 30th of January 2020, and what that did was bring the EU Direct Payments Legislation for the 2020 scheme year pertained to the UK law. Now, in order to make the, the EU legislation operable, a DEFR then brought a forward a two UK-wide statutory instruments that made a number of technical corrections to uh, EU legislation, but also contained in that was they made some technical corrections to their own domestic legislation, which implemented some policy decisions related to direct payments. And uh, that um, domestic legislation, there are similar versions of it in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, Scotland and Wales have made a uh, similar amendments and we are now at, uh, at the situation where we are also making or have made the amendments. Um, this piece of legislation operates uh, under the, the confirmatory procedure uh, in order that it can be made quickly because the least amount of time that we have regulations that are technically not just right, uh, the, the better. Uh, I'll just run through uh, briefly what it, what it does. Uh, first of all, if we go to part two of the regulation, 
the uh, it amends the uh, common agricultural policy basic payment and support schemes regulations Northern Ireland 2015 uh, the first amendment which relates to regulation 4 uh, that just clarifies that paragraph 3 uh, it's for the purposes uh, that of uh, Article 22.1 of the Horizontal Implementing Regulation, that's Regulation 809-2014, that, that is for the purposes of the 2020 scheme year direct payments, which is what the, the carryover of the EU legislation relates to, so that just clarifies that. The, the deadline for applications, which is what Regulation uh, 4 is relating to, remains unchanged at the 15th of May. Amendment number, the second amendment, which is in Regulation 12, um, that is just uh, removing references to the EU regulation of 1307-2013, which have become incorrect uh, due to how the EU regulation has been maintained in UK law, and uh, because operability amendments have been made by the DEFRA SA uh, in this regulation, which has changed the references. <coughs> That regulation refers to the minimum claim size, which is unchanged at three hectares. Uh, the third amendment, which relates to regulation uh, 16, is just removing an incorrect reference to Article 2C of the Direct Payments Regulation. And regulation 16 relates to the three species that can be considered a short rotational coppice, which can be used to make ecological focus area requirements under greening. Uh, we move then to Amendment 4, which relates to Regulation 20. Um, and this is a rewording, so we can get the words included to had effect immediately before exit day. And that's just to make clear that the references to the EU regulation as it applied before EU exit and therefore extends the areas designated as environmentally sensitive permanent grassland on the 31st of January 2020 to the 31st of December 2020, so that it covers the 2020 scheme year. But there is no change to the fields which are considered environmentally sensitive permanent grassland and are subject to a ploughing ban. If I then move on to the amendments to the Common Agricultural Policy Control and Enforcement Regulations, Northern Ireland 2015, uh, the first amendment there which uh, relates to Regulation 1. Um, that is just correcting the reference to the definition of direct payments. Uh, the second amendment, uh, again, which relates to Regulation 1, <coughs> clarifies that the references to the two EU regulations are to how they have been retained in UK law after the operability amendments and they relate to direct payments for the 2020 claim year. And finally, the third amendment in to do with Regulation 7, it excludes the reference to a Commission official uh, to accompany an authorised person at an on-farm inspection for the 2020 claim year. As the 2020 claim year will all be paid from national funds, there is no need for the EU Commission to carry out audits involving on-farm visits. So, Chair, sure, that is a run through what the regulation does. Uh, it is very technical. It doesn't change. It is no, there are no policy changes within it. But these are minor technical corrections to make sure that our regulations <coughs> are technically correct. Oh, thank, thank you, Mark, um, for that uh, presentation. Um, Whenever we get briefed on this uh, previously, we were told that the, the, the pot for the direct payments was $293 million, uh, for 2020. Is, is that still That's the still case? the case, yes. There's, there's no... Um, <coughs> and uh, in terms of... Um, I think the Minister also indicated that it would be possible to pay the entire amount in October as opposed to like a part payment in October. Yes. Is the department still on course for... Yes. Cover full payment. Yes, and uh, corrections were made uh, to the EU legislation as it was retained in UK law to allow the 100% of the payment to be made from the 16th of October. And uh, will will the de is the department confident? Obviously, I know from 
Page experience that there be a, a deluge of applications in, in or around the middle of May, which is the deadline. Will the department have the time to process them and to have them all issued by October? That you're confident of that? Yeah. Well, in previous years, we 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 had to have them all processed yeah. in order to make any part of the payment. So you know it should be the same in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, really, there's not a big difference between making 70 percent of the payment yeah. and 100 percent of the payment in terms of the processes we have to go yeah. through. I think that would be welcomed by most farmers or all farmers. William? Yeah, listen, when we look at it in the main, as you say, the, the amendments are technical. Um, and I think that the department needs to be congratulated on getting to a position where they are, the only place in the UK or Ireland. You know, I think that we're able to pay advance payments early and, and are in a position that. Um, you have now got 100% applications online. I think it's. I think. I say that I think you need to congratulate it in that regard. I think it worked very well. I think a lot of people had concerns that it would be undeliverable, but it, it certainly has been. And I have congratulate you in regard to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, as there. Um, there are no uh, other members uh, who have indicated they want to speak. Uh, I'll put the question. The committee has considered SR 2020 22, the, the CAP Direct Payments to Farmers Misleading Amendments Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that can be confirmed by the Assembly. Great. 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 Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mark and Carol, for. Um, okay. Um, so you might want to just move on to the rest of the committee business. Okay. And then come back to go to item 6 and page 5. Page 5. Okay, um, members, as the uh, LMC representatives uh, haven't quite arrived yet, we will we'll just move on. We'll move on to um, pages 37 to 59 in your pack. It's written briefing from DERA, consultation on the UK Global Tariff. Um, I want to advise members that the Department for International Trade has launched its public consultation on the UK Global Tariff, developing the UK Global Tariff Policy. Although international trade is not a devolved matter, it is important for the agri-food sector from the point of view of export sales. The UK Government intends to customise a tariff schedule that fits the needs of its economy and one that encourages free trade. The proposals for the UK Global Tariff take the current EU Most Favoured Nation tariff, which applies until the end of the transition period, simplify it and relax it through a number of adjustments which are detailed on page 38 of your pack. The protocol would mean that we continue to apply EU external uh, tariff regime which could result on, uh, on the ability of any business and goods to compete in the British market. Members may wish to note that there is still a large degree of uncertainty about what will be the UK position and much will depend on future trade deals as well as other reserve matters outside our control. Um, as this will have an impact on the UK Agriculture Bill, can I seek members' agreement to add the briefing papers onto the committee web page and reference it onto our, our report? Are members content with that? Okay, okay members, um, we're going to move also now to deal with correspondence. Um, if you want to refer to page 61 to 62 of your pack, um, each item of the correspondence uh, has a suggested action. And uh, I want you also to note uh, item 4, which is a workshop on the Environment Bill at the Mac Theatre on the 31st of March. Can I ask members to note also note uh, item 7, from our sister committee in the Scottish Parliament in connection with a possible workshop on climate change in November 2020. Um, are we uh, content to action the correspondence as suggested? Content. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the forward work programme um, is at pages 114 to 120 uh, that the LCM and the Environment Bill is now anticipated to be laid in the business office on the 18th of April which means the committee would sign off its report on the 23rd of April. The Assembly would potentially consider the LCM at the plenary on the 4th of May. I want to advise members that there will be a departmental briefing on the budget, uh, 21-22 budget, on the 23rd of April, in preparation for the budget debates in plenary. Um, can I get an agreement for the um, forward work programme? Great. Great. Okay, I'll bring back to item 
Okay. 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 I want to go back now. Um, we're going to receive an oral briefing from the Livestock and Meat Commission. The briefing paper uh, from the LMC is at page 23 to 35 of your packs. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity now to, uh, and also uh, there's uh, some information on page three of the table papers. I'd like to take the opportunity now to welcome Jared McGivern, the chairman of the LMC, and Ian Stevenson, the uh, chief executive of the LMC. And I'd like to invite you to brief the committee, after which there will be an opportunity for members to ask some questions. So. Go ahead. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, thank you very much for affording Livestock and Meat Commission an opportunity to um, come and speak to you today. Uh, in many respects, what we do tends to be a bit under the radar, so we always welcome the opportunity to come and speak to committee and, and, and indeed to, to any grouping. Um, I understand, as you've said, Chairman, a, a briefing paper has been circulated, so I propose just to give you a very brief overview of the Commission, and then afterwards myself and colleague Ian here can answer any questions you might have. Uh, I suppose, like, like all non-departmental public bodies, we are a creature of statute, uh, specifically the Livestock Marketing Commission uh, Act for Northern Ireland 1967. Under the Act, the main duty of LMC is to examine and recommend improvements in the marketing of livestock and livestock products. Uh, and we are funded by industry by way of levies, which we collect from uh, beef and lamb uh, producers and from processors. And also, LMC um, advises the department on uh, <coughs> uh, matters relating to the sector. Now, the work of the commission is overseen by a board of directors. Uh, six directors, including myself, are appointed by the uh, by the minister, and it's our uh, duty to or our role to represent the interests of our stakeholders uh, with impartiality and objectivity. Uh, and as a board, we also have corporate responsibility to ensure that the objectives set out for us by the department and approved by the minister. Uh, are, 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 are delivered. Uh, we have a very close working relationship with the, with the department. I'd like to take the opportunity to commend the minister and his officials in this regard. Uh, we are, of course, very mindful that our prime responsibility is to service the uh, interests of producers and processors who, as you know, fund us. Uh, and we engage continuously in um, uh, consultation, both formally and informally, uh, with industry in order to ensure we continue to meet their needs. Uh, Livestock and Meat Commission is a small, uh, is a small organisation. We have a staffing complement of 18, an annual income of just um, under £2.3 million. Pounds. Uh, £1.63 million of this comes from the statutory levy, which we, which we collect from beef and lamb producers and the processors. And approximately £1.3 million is funded by way of voluntary subscription uh, by members or from members of our uh, Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assurance Scheme. And I'll, I'll refer to that. Um, Shortly, we may have a small budget, but we do represent a very uh, significant industry. Some 20,000 farmers here in the north um, are classified as beef and sheep uh, uh, producers, and um, the processing sector employs over 5,000 uh, people uh, in Northern Ireland, with an annual turnover in excess of 1.3 uh, billion pounds. <clears throat> over 87 percent of red meat sales are outside Northern Ireland. So the red meat industry is a very significant contributor uh, to the local economy, and that's the message we, we want to continue to get out there into the, into the public. Uh, in terms of services we provide, it can be, I suppose, um, broken down into two broad areas, market information and industry development. In terms of market information, LMC procures and analyses and disseminates information on domestic and international markets. Um, uh, legislation, economic developments uh, uh, to industry. We do that by way of weekly bulletins, text messages, radio broadcasts, and also website updates as well. And of course, the LMC provides a price reporting service uh, on, uh, for the department on prices of uh, paid by factories at slaughter. Uh, and this is a, a, a service which is very highly regarded by industry. In terms of our outward-looking focus, we are a long-standing and active member, and indeed contributor, to the UK Export Certification Partnership. This is a joint industry-government initiative focused on facilitating access to third country markets for UK meat and livestock uh, products. The last part of our work sometimes um, um, uh, goes largely unseen, but it's one that is of uh, considerable interest to the industry, particularly to our processors. In terms of industry development, 
LMC owns and manages the Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assurance uh, Scheme. There are over 12,000 active farmers uh, 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 in Northern Ireland who, who, who are members of the Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assurance Mark. And this is one of the longest running quality assurance marks in the world. In fact, we've reached our 30th year uh, this year. Um, even more important, um, uh, the uh, Northern Ireland mark is also recognised as equivalent to and therefore can be traded under the uh, red tractor scheme in GB. And that's obviously a very important market for us uh, here. NMC is also the beef and sheep meat industry's promotional body, and we're involved in a wide range of marketing activity um, to support the industry and, and its products, both domestically and in export markets. Um, locally, we conduct over 350 post-primary school uh, cookery demonstrations, where we, where we go in um, and, and we teach uh, young people on the uh, 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 nutritional benefits um, of um, cooking and eating um, Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assured Lamb. In fact, lamb, beef and lamb. In fact, we, we've conducted over 380 of these in the past year. Uh, this is also complemented by uh, a professional development event for food and nutrition teachers. So very important. Uh, a lot of school kids go through this. And it's also tied in with the curriculum as well, which is very important. NMC is engaged also in consumer promotion through delivery of high-profile uh, high advertising through events um, on, on TV um, and also through radio and print, social media and online. And again, that's uh, um, getting the message out there about uh, Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assured uh, uh, beef, beef and Lamb and not only the nutritional benefits but also the, the provenance uh, 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 and, how, and how the animals are reared and so on. Now, we do monitor the impact of our advertising, which of course is important, and a most recent omnibus survey which, which we conducted identified that over 80% of, of Northern Ireland consumers are aware of Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assured Beef, and 78% um, are aware of Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assured Lamb. So that's quite high, um, uh, but we, can, we can't always, of course, take that for, for granted, and we have to continue uh, to work on it. In terms of sustainable development, we are involved in quite a number of initiatives. Uh, in a, uh, both with our stakeholders and with government. Uh, we're involved in a number of forums advising supporting the research needs of the red meat sector and also providing technical information to industry as well. LMC also represents Northern Ireland red meat industry in a number of greenhouse gas platforms and sustainability initiatives and we develop supply chain communications in, in these areas. And I suppose in the current climate with uh, focus particularly of the younger generation on on climate change and the environment, this is becoming an even more important aspect of the work that LMC does on behalf of stakeholders. So I suppose, Chairman, to, to, to sum up, uh, the work which we do is set out in a three-year strategic plan. Uh, the current plan runs up to 2021. Uh, that is undertaken as a result of extensive consultation with, with our stakeholders uh, and with those who fund us. Uh, our, our doors are always open and we want to hear the views of our stakeholders. Indeed, we'd be quite happy to hear the views of, of committee members here today. We continue to review our work in line with the priorities identified by our, our stakeholders and we deliver these in line with the statutory functions um, that, uh, uh, that guide what we do. And, and again, further details have been circulated uh, in, in, in the paper uh, to you. So, Chairman, I, I'll wrap up at this stage. Um, thank you for taking the time, members, to, to listen uh, to me and we're quite happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, for that um, very detailed and comprehensive briefing. Um, I suppose one of the, the questions that I may ask, and it's directly linked to the previous uh, briefing that we received, um, in your paper you did identify um, a number of important issues, particularly that around direct payments. <coughs> and this is something that we've been looking at very closely here uh, in the committee. Uh, including uh, evidence from Dr. Dobbs and Dr. Gravy of uh, Queen's University, that who said that um, if if the direct payments ended, that as many as 30% of farms would um, go out of business and resulting in land abandonment and um, economic decline in those areas. Um, do you have any assessment um, of the importance of direct payments for the continuation of the agri food uh, industry here? Yeah, well, in terms of um, our industry, you know, certainly the, as, as the chairman has rightly said, the, the scale of our, our farming enterprises in Northern Ireland, we have about 20,000 beef and sheep farmers, most of which would be categorised as small or very small, you know, in terms of the, I suppose, the, the labour unit um, per, per farm. So they are um, a critically important part of the fabric of our industry here in Northern Ireland in terms of the raw material supply. So 
working with um, you know, stakeholders in the Farmers Union and in, in, the, in the Northern Ireland meat exporters, we've been trying to take a look at how do we try and prevent the suckler herd and the breeding ewe flock from declining any further, you know, because we have seen significant declines in both of those populations of cattle and sheep in recent years. Um, so as part of the development of the new agricultural policy, certainly we've been trying to engage you know, what level of support or what form of support should those farms get going forward? Because, you know, as you've rightly identified, those farms can't survive without the support. If you look at the pure economic aspects of those farms, you know, some of them actually, you know, um, if they didn't have single farm payment, you know, their, their production wouldn't even cover cost. You know, so the, the single farm payment is a key element in the income and, and sustainability of those farms. So it's how, how do you actually design a system that, that keeps those businesses in the areas that, that they're in because they're critical to the, you know, not just to the raw material supply, but to the, you know, the rural societies in which they're based, you know, because a lot of our, our breeding population and our cattle and sheep flocks are in, you know, the, the hill areas and severely disadvantaged areas. So, you know, that's a key, a key element and, and certainly I'm aware that the Assembly was debating that issue not that, that long ago as well. So it's important to try and have these conversations. Um, you know, we certainly feel that the sector can't survive without support going forward, so um, we don't have all the answers at this stage in terms of what that support should look like, um, but certainly it's a piece of work we're doing with our industry at the minute to try and, and put some, some of our own thoughts into the discussions around future agricultural policy and how that might you know, shake out in the future, because I suppose we have it's one of the key opportunities we have, I suppose as a consequence of Brexit, is to try and design a policy that, that meets the needs of our industry. Well, just on the topic of Brexit, would you have any assessment of the uh, impact of the protocol on the meat industry? I guess our, our industry, uh, I suppose, is waiting to see, you know, sort of what, um, you know, I suppose there, there are a number of sectors. If you look at it, I suppose, from a, a primary agricultural sector, you know, obviously our our farming industry, you know, moves livestock, you know, certainly within Northern Ireland and, and there are a lot of our, our sheep are across the border for, for slaughter in the Republic of Ireland. So how that trade will operate in the future, I suppose, is, is important to the industry. About 50% of our sheep are slaughtered in the Republic of Ireland and, and that meat then tends to be largely exported onto the European Union. About 70% of our sheep meat would end up in, in EU markets, um, less so on the beef side. But our, our beef industry in Northern Ireland, we're largely dependent on the GB market. About 80% of our, our beef is sold in the UK, about 10% in Northern Ireland, about 70% in Great Britain. So in terms of what these exit declarations are going to look like, <coughs> sort of, um, you know, uh, paperwork will be involved is certainly a, a key issue for our industry. Um, you know, our industry is very clear that they want unfettered and, and, and friction-free trade with our major markets, so that's, that's certainly a key issue for us. I know certainly a lot of our, our primary processing and secondary processing sector would move product into Northern Ireland from other business premises that they have in GB for further processing and, and how that will look like in terms of if tariffs have to be paid and then reclaim back again and, and how all that's going to work out in practice. There's probably more questions than there are answers at this, at this stage, but um, certainly the, the industry is, is, is keen to get clarity on these issues as, as soon as they possibly can because it's, it's very hard to make planning decisions and, and business decisions in the absence of such clarity. Just before I move around, just one last point before I move around. See, in relation to the British market, and I appreciate that um, 80% of our beef is sold across the British market? Right? Yeah, I suppose if you include Northern Ireland, within about 80% of our beef sold in the UK, roughly I say 10% of that would be Northern Ireland, 70% GB. Well, you know, there are stakeholders who are concerned that the, uh, the, the UK, the British government, um, their failure to include minimum food standards in the agriculture bill uh, is will open the door to cheap and fair um, imports from other parts of the world. And along with their the policy across the water uh, to effectively phase out direct support and entice farmers to buy out their entitlements and leave them, see that the fact that they turn Britain into like a Singapore where there'll be no food production at all. What impact do you think that would have for the British market, uh, for farmers here who export into that market? 
Huge issue. Um, certainly, you know, we did a piece of work, I think it was 2017 we published it, we did a, a piece of work looking at the potential impact of WTO trading on the uh, beef and sheep meat industry in Northern Ireland. You know, if you, if you operate at a sort of a liberal trading type and, uh, environment that you're talking about, um, you know, it certainly would cause great concern. We, we have an industry that has built its reputation on the basis of standards and the basis of integrity, traceability, quality assurance. You know, you know, we do have a, a significant additional cost base associated with production, particularly in our part of the world. We have small scale farming businesses. You know, we've got that farm family model that I think everybody wants to protect going yeah. forward. So we do operate at a higher cost base, but those higher costs you know, hopefully generate additional higher revenue in the major markets in which we're supplying those those products into. So anything that undermines that market going forward um, certainly will have an impact on us, even though we may technically be aligned with EU standards in, in our own jurisdiction here in Northern Ireland going forward. Our major market is still Great Britain. So if anything that changes the demographic in that market in terms of, um, you know, the market returns, you know, certainly will have a big, a big impact in Northern Ireland. So I can understand why there is such a focus on making sure that, yeah. you know, there is a legislative basis to, you know, no undermining of UK standards in future trade deals. Because if you look at the major deals that the UK has indicated it wants to do in the initial phases, you've USA, you've got Australia, you've got New Zealand, they're all major agricultural exporters. You know, they'll be looking in terms of these trade deals, their offensive interests will be in agricultural products, no doubt about that. You know, and, mm. and why wouldn't they? That's what, you know, that's, you know, so as part of those trade deals, certainly we would be, you know, very keen to make sure that, you know, sensitive products like beef and lamb, you know, are such, you know, that they are treated as sensitive products and that there isn't an undermining of, of standards um, that basically our industry and, and, our, and our government systems have built up over years to try and develop that. <laughs> Um, integrity and quality <coughs> that, that we're familiar with, you know, because that's what a lot of our international customers, you know, they, they want to buy products from the UK based on the standards and systems that we have in place. So um, we certainly don't want to see that being undermined. Thanks. I'm going to move around members. Pat. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, thanks very much for uh, being here today and presenting to us, uh, Mr. McGovern and Mr. Stevenson. My question is. Um, I'm sort of new onto this committee and I'm trying to catch up, but what I picked up from reading your report was that you have control, or not control, sorry, but you monitor the prices to the abattoirs. Do you monitor the prices at the other end going out from the abattoirs? We don't, I suppose that, that's commercial market information, which, which we wouldn't have access to. The only people really that would have access to that information would be the businesses uh, trading directly with the retail customers or food service customers. So we, we are the, you know, so we provide a service to the Department of Agriculture in Northern Ireland to do statutory price reporting of cattle. So that's governed by EU legislation and, and presumably will become part of UK legislation as well in terms of market transparency. So that deadweight trade, we provide the price reporting and analysis of that and, and, and report that weekly in, in our weekly bulletin and, and do analysis of that. The retail side of things, what a retailer is paying a, a meat processor for, for product, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't get that information. That's well, commercially I sensitive. suppose what I'm trying to get to the question is, I mean, uh, looking at the price, say, of of an animal going to slaughter and the price which that's coming out of and adding up, just trying to look at that research myself, there seems to be a really big difference in the price that the abattoirs are getting for their product and there's nothing at all, there's nothing within your remit that you can check those prices. To me there just seems to be something wrong with the, an industry, you know, where that base product is, is, is barnace than that which is coming out of the other. And the, the larger cuts of meat can be sold here locally, and even those hind quarters or whatever is left can be exported now and a big demand for them in China. You have no control over that end of that at all. Well, I suppose there's, there's, there's two things there. One, in terms of the price transparency, I know it's certainly something that our, our industry is keener to, to try and get a, a clearer handle on. 
Um, there are certain things, you know, there, there are obviously analysts that, you know, look at retail prices on the shelves and stuff like that. You know, we can certainly analyse that type of information and we do that. You know, Cantar World Panel and some of these other types of organisations, you know, collect data on a regular basis and you can see the trends and how retail prices and things are moving and, and obviously, you know, you can work out a, a certain percentage. But the, the red meat industry effectively in Northern Ireland is a disassembly business, you know, so if you present an animal to an abattoir today for slaughter, you know, no one customer buys that entire animal. Yeah. So, you know, the UK market's largely, you could say it's almost like a mince in a steak market. You know, about 50% of the beef that's sold in, in GB would be mince. Yeah. You know, that's the major um, steaks then are obviously a, an important market. Unfortunately, that was, the steak market was under pressure last year, uh, largely as a consequence of the weather not being particularly wonderful last year. But the... Um, the rest of the components of the carcass, the industry has to try and generate as much revenue as possible. So you might send the feet of the animal to Ghana. You might send parts and components all over the world, you know, just in terms of trying to generate the maximum revenue possible. I'm sure you'll agree with Mr. Stevenson uh, that uh, the price, the discrepancy in the price, uh, I mean, the, the sums of it just don't add up. There's someone taking a huge cut somewhere. And if we can't get a hold of that uh, chair, you know, we can't look at the fundamentals of that. There's something I, I need to question, and maybe it's not for for <coughs> for 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 this group here, but I'm sure there is some way that we can look at this price discrepancy, which the farmers are getting mm. uh, for all of that work, and then that huge lift in price, which comes at the other end whenever that product yeah. that is sold. That's my point. I'm trying to make is, and you're telling me you have no control on that. I guess, Chairman, one area we, we do try to influence is communication within the supply chain. And, and one initiative which we've been running for a number of years now is, is, is walk the line, we call it, yeah. which is encouraging uh, farmers, uh, producers to to visit the uh, the processors. And, and that's, that's organised in, in advance to give the producers some insights into what happens to the animal after it's, it's left them. And that is, is a way of trying to, I suppose, in, 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 encourage greater communication and greater trust within the uh, within the uh, supply chain, and that's something we continue to roll out. So, producers, I'm sorry, just one more, one more wee. Producers, okay, you have that with the producers, uh, with those then that um, move it to that next stage. Uh, I see that there is levy, or there, you, you, you do have contact with them as well. Yeah. So, I mean, do they make it aware to you, the price di di differential, or how do you even, I mean, Surely there should be a greater a levy coming from them to yourselves. Well, in terms of, I suppose, the, the levy that, that, that we that we collect as an organisation, so we're, we're funded equally by farmers and processors, yeah. so we collect the same amount of levy from both. It's, it's um, the processors, Mr. It's the, the jump in money yeah. to the processors that I want to get to. Mm -hmm. It's that part, and who's watching that? I mean, you, you, I, mean I thought that that would have been yeah. part of your brief. Yeah, well... well Certainly, part of our brief is to look at the, um, I suppose, the value of the markets into which we're, we're selling our products. If you look at the value of the UK market, certainly there, there is analysis of that market in terms of retail prices, food service prices, etc. And you can see <coughs> the opportunities, you know, in terms of what we do as an organisation, you know, a big part of our role is really about trying to promote the industry, communicate the message of the industry and make sure that we actually have access to those markets. So if you look at our prices, our prices at the minute are very similar to GB prices. You know, there, there used to be quite a significant price differential between ourselves and Great Britain. Where we've got to in recent years is actually we're quite closely aligned. If you looked at the prices at the minute, there's not very much difference no. between ourselves and GB. We're quite far ahead of the Republic of Ireland price. So yes, can, I, can I come in, George? Oh, yeah, you we think need a few more members here now. This, I know, this is my last one. But do you think there may well be... Is it like it's, uh, to me, it looks like there's, on the processing side, there seems to be some sort of a monopoly in play right across the whole of the United Kingdom, and probably within the Republic of Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom as well. Do you believe that? Or? I would suggest that that doesn't happen. You know, certainly knowing knowing the businesses and knowing the operations of those businesses, if you actually talk to each of the individual processors, a lot of their, their individual sites almost have to stand on their own two feet. You know, they're almost you know, um, individual units with their, with their own, um, you know, marketplaces. So 
I certainly know that you know working with the processing industry, there is a collective interest in issues when it comes to things like Brexit and, and how that's going to impact on a pre-competitive basis the entire industry. When it comes to businesses and the competing nature of businesses, you know, it's actually a fairly cutthroat market that the, the red meat industry works within. So, you know, I, I know an issue has. It, it, it continues to be, I suppose, mentioned by farmers all, all over the years, you know, that there must be a monopoly working, etc., because prices are always quite close. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the processor business, they're all serving different customers. You know, they're, they're competing in, in the same space. They're competing with international competitors. So the one thing, you know, I would say we actually have a very good functioning market. Um, yes, the market could generate more return. It's a very competitive market. That's the challenge, you know, as to how do we get more money back into the supply chain that farmers can get a sustainable living and the processors can make a margin as well because it is a high turnover, high throughput, low margin business, you know, beef and sheep meat processing. Um, and unfortunately, I suppose a lot of our farmers, you know, they're just not generating enough revenue to, to, to justify, you know, particularly staying... <coughs> The, the farmers that are under the most pressure are those that are probably the medium and large scale farmers that are trying to run their businesses as full time businesses. A lot of our small farming businesses, farmers, a lot of their farmers have bought farm income and that almost sustains their income along with their single farm payment. How sustainable that is, I suppose, is, is, is a question going forward. But it's those medium and large scale farmers, the ones that are under real pressure at the minute, uh, from what we can see. Thank you, Ian. Um, all right. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, Good to see Good you, Terry. Yeah. Thanks for coming today. Appreciate it. Um, first of all, just a few comments, then a wee question. So, the services you provide, market information and industry development, I mean, very good headings there. Very impressed with uh, education, 350 plus post primary cookery demonstrations, proof of the puddings and the eating. So, mm -hmm. I think that's very good. And um, the 80% of uh, Customers are aware of the farm quality assured. Stuff like that's very good, so it's all out there. It's kind of sad to see it's your headquarters at a farm, 2016, so I hope you are getting there without it and getting it sorted, what you'll do. My question would be on the coronavirus. Is there any planning happening in the industry around the potential impacts of the virus and worst case scenario? Say, for example, we have a full or partial lockdown. How would that impact on marts and abattoirs? Thank you. John, well, I'd maybe um, certainly talking to you know the processing businesses that are operating here in Northern Ireland. A lot of them have already, I suppose, taken steps maybe ahead of some of the, the steps that are being taken publicly uh, across the UK at the moment. I know certainly a lot of businesses, you know, with their their workforce, they have already imposed sort of non-essential travel, you know, within their own businesses because. It's maybe easier if you get somebody that, that happens to come into contact with uh, the coronavirus to, to deep clean a building. How do you deep clean a factory that has product within it? How do you deep clean? You know, so I, I know certainly a lot of our, our processing businesses are, are, are very mindful of, of the, the developing situation. Um, I think as an industry, you know, we, we play a key part in feeding the population. So, you know, locking down the food supply chain is easier said than done. Um, I do recall back to the day when we had foot and mouth in 2001, you know, which was a livestock virus, you know, and, and certainly livestock markets and all those things were, were ceased operating and that caused tremendous disruption and, and, and economic hardship on a lot of farm and, 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 and agricultural businesses. So, you know, we certainly don't want to see the situation developing that we get into such a scenario, but I think like everybody, we're, we're Pretty concerned about you know how the how the situation is evolving, um, how it's going to, I suppose, pan out over the, the coming days and weeks. I suppose will will be judged by the, the experts and, and, and the health side in terms of what advice they give to industry. But I know certainly some of the industry players are already trying to do what they can, you know, try and reduce the potential exposure of their staff. Because as I think it was Pat rightly said, a lot of our businesses operate across the UK. Some of the business interests in Europe as well. So there's people always moving. You know, you have servicing customers, you know, sort of trying to develop new business, you know, going to, you know, um, meet customers. You know, it's an almost daily occurrence. So those types of things, you know, I think where that's being, where that can be done over the phone or by Skype or these sorts of things, you know, certainly businesses are taking a responsible approach to try and do that at the moment. 
Yeah, um, I mean, you're, you're dead right, you can't lock down the food chain, you know, that's one thing, so it's just all about precautions really. I know uh, my area, a few people contact me, St. Field Mart would be the closest one, so just mm. have concerns about it, so that's all. So <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you, Chair. Um, Philip? Uh, I was going to ask about coronavirus, so that's not even asked, but just in terms of your paper saying that uh, you represent the, the industry on platforms discussing greenhouse gases, just maybe a wee bit of detail how that's going, and you also, uh, in your paper, you refer to climate change and uh, raise concerns with the levels of ammonia and sometimes the agriculture seen as part of the problem. How can you turn that around and, and be seen as part of the solution? I guess our role, and I'll let the end maybe give a bit more detail, our role is very much, I suppose, to support industry, particularly in terms of any research uh, that, that can be carried out as well. And we've been very mindful that particularly ammonia is an issue of considerable concern to uh, producers. So our role would be, I suppose, to support them in terms of, of, of maybe identifying uh, um, uh, mitigation member uh, measures, carbon sequestration. Uh, carbon storage and so on, and trying to look at, help look at the science uh, around that as well, which, which is important. But and maybe I'll let Ian, because Ian does sit on, 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 on the, uh, a number of the platforms individually himself, so let him give those details. So uh, if you look at the issue of climate change, it's, um, there's a lot of, I suppose, terminology around it, but there's a, there's a term that's often used, the word local. It's a global issue, but local solutions. You know, so in terms of what we do here in Northern Ireland, um, the Department of Agriculture actually uh, works along with industry. So, uh, we, have a, we have a greenhouse gas implementation platform here in Northern Ireland that I chair the red meat subgroup of. You know, so we have been looking at a whole range of initiatives over the last sort of 10 years, you could say, in terms of how do we, how do we advance the, uh, I suppose, the, the, the greenhouse gas agenda here in Northern Ireland. So the, the, the whole sort of theme of our strategy in Northern Ireland is around the efficient farming cuts greenhouse gases. So the more you can reduce the carbon intensity per kilo of output, which is the key strategy we're working on here in Northern Ireland. So if you're producing a kilo of milk or a kilo of beef or a kilo of lamb, if you can reduce the carbon intensity of that product through more efficient practices, so getting your livestock to slaughter earlier, you know, having better food efficiency, using better genetics, using low emission slurry spreading techniques, all of these things, the industry has really been working closely with government to try and deliver. In terms of what the chairman's saying, you know, a part of what we've been trying to do in Northern Ireland and AFPE is a key player in terms of doing some of the research in this, how do we actually get credit for what we achieve as an industry? You know, particularly through our logging up carbon in soils, you know, so it's, it's certainly known that well-managed grassland, you know, if you're actually, you know, if you just let land become abandoned, and that's one of the big concerns we have, Chairman, about the agricultural policy. If land becomes abandoned, then it doesn't sequester the same amount of carbon. So if you have well, well managed, well grazed grassland, it continues to lock up carbon in the soil. Um, so a key aspect of what we do is really to try and how do we get those, those credentials recognised? And, and through some of the international platforms we're involved in, there's a European Roundtable for Beef Sustainability and a global roundtable that we're also involved in is really how do we actually as an industry try and and get the message out there that you know we're not killing the planet you know um, and there's a lot of science coming to the fore now around you know how different greenhouse gases are treated you know so methane actually um, if you don't actually increase livestock numbers um, so say for example we stayed steady in terms of our livestock numbers going forward the science now would suggest that we're not actually adding anything greenhouse gas emissions because methane is a short-lived gas in the atmosphere. It breaks down after about 10 years. If you increase your numbers, then you gradually build up an accumulation of methane. So carbon dioxide continues to build up in the atmosphere. So all of these gases are converted into carbon dioxide equivalents. So there's science now saying, well, why are we doing that? You know, so some work that has been done by the Oxford Martin School at, at Oxford University is now sort of suggesting that there needs to be a different approach in terms of how greenhouse gases are um, measured and, and, and certainly in, in, in inventories in terms of the industry's contribution to climate change because you know carbon dioxide behaves differently to methane to nitrous oxide for example the main gases that are involved in the agricultural side um, so there, there is a lot of work there's a lot of discussion going on in that space at the moment but as a, as a general sort of body that represents and, and works on behalf of the industry we have saying the agricultural industry has a key part to play in helping to solve the climate change solution, we're not 
we're not just part of the cause, but we're part of the solution. That's certainly the, the angle that we take. Yeah. Okay, Philip. Um, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You should probably welcome along. Um, Suckler cow numbers have been declining, and I think you did mention it in your presentation. This could be an issue. Scotland has some couple support, I think, calf premium. What's your view on some sort of couple support to help sustain the industry? Certainly, uh, William, it's one of the areas that we're, we're discussing with uh, the farming and processing sector as to what, what form of support actually um, the suckler herd needs going for. Because at the minute, the average suckler herd is 17.4 cows, I think, was the most recent data. Um, so what level of, of, of coupled support would, would you attach to, to sustain that type of business? Um, so it's one of the issues that, you know, whenever um, the debate around the last reform of the Common Agricultural Policy, and we're still part of that, around the whole decoupling of payments away from those direct headage payments to area-based payments. There was a huge discussion within industry at that time, uh, and certainly I think industry came down on the side of, you know, at that time, because there was so, because there was so little you could attach to the coupled payment, it just, it just made people keep livestock, the set of keeping livestock. So it did nothing for quality, did nothing for efficiency, did nothing for the genetic improvement of the herd. So if you actually want to consider some form of coupled payment, how do you get a benefit from it? Certainly to the industry and to the farmer, because you know if you just do it at a purely numbers based system, you're not actually driving forward a lot of efficiency improvements or you know improvements on the area of you know climate change and and things areas that we actually as an industry know we need to do more as part of our sustainability journey. So there's a lot of discussion going on at the moment as to you know if there if there is to be um, some form of coupled support, what would that look like? But you know I haven't heard you know, I've heard different cases being made by different parts of the industry saying we need it, other parts saying we don't necessarily need it. So it's how you design a system. But where everybody is certainly on one page is we need support. <laughs> There's other regions like Republic of Ireland, Scotland, is given support. Two different support. mechanisms. Two different me mechanisms, yeah. absolutely. So in Scotland, there's obviously attached to like a three quarter bred beef animal, you know, so they, they've linked it to the calf as opposed to the cow. In the south, there are obviously payments on you know genetic improvement, you know, part of their schemes. I, I thought there was one benefit in, in, in attributing it to the calf means people just don't keep a cow for the sake of keeping a cow, that you have to have a calf, you know what I mean? I think that's and that, and that was part of the challenge of the old coupled payment system in the past that it wasn't necessarily linked to those sort of productive elements yeah. and, and efficiency improvement elements. One more, I yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, in relation to exports, uh, and 70% of our total sales go to the UK, and 17% to uh, the, EU, the EU market. Given that now we are out of Europe, do you see any opportunity to increase sales to the UK market? Well, certainly the um, the, the industry in the UK wants to make sure that you know we continue to, to have the, the, the major share of that market. And it, it is an undersupplied market. You know, certainly there's a lot of product has to be imported into the UK, it's 60% self-sufficient. So there, there is a lot of food comes into the UK. In order to, and I suppose it's one of those things, to grow your presence in the domestic market, you also need to grow your presence in the export market, because it's all to do with carcass balance. So whilst the UK says, you know, a big chunk of that market is mince, you know, but the rest of the components of your, your animal, so the stacks, the UK is a good market for the stack, industry um, but you know where the real pressure has been coming on on industry in, in recent years is the is the components of the animal that we don't necessarily eat a lot of in the UK so your fifth quarter as it's called flanks etc offals um, a lot of the round cuts the traditional roast round cuts that you'd be familiar with you know people aren't consuming those to the same degree as they used to if they are they're eating more sort of mini roasts and things like that you know the traditional sort of um, a lot more people are eating out of the home as well you know, I think we're, we're heading something like in, in America, something like 50% of the calories that people consume are now eaten out of the home. In the UK, it's not as high as that, it's about 35%, but we're heading that direction. So it's how you actually service those markets. And to do that, you, you, you need the widest range of market access possible. So we want to be able to sell bits of the animal that can generate good money in China. You know, beef tongue, the best market for beef tongue in the world is in Japan. 
you know, so there's different markets can take different parts of the animal, and it's getting, I suppose, access to those markets uh, in as low a tariff sort of opportunity as possible, because a lot of those markets still apply tariffs, but and some of those markets the EU have agreements with that has been reducing tariffs, you know, so where that leaves us from a Northern Ireland context, you know, will we, we, will we have access to some of those um, opportunities in the future? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions around that, that space, but to yeah. answer your question, yes, we want to try to get as much of the GB market as possible. Okay. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, Rosemary? Thank you. Um, my question sort of follow, follows on from yours, Pat. It's in relation to the beef industry. Um, you said that you service the interests of farmers, and you will know, note that, or you know that farming income has been reduced by 25 per cent this past uh, over, over the past year or so. Beef prices still are lower than 2017-18 prices, which was on the news just yesterday. I I listened to when I was travelling. So, can you? I'm still not convinced by what you are doing to support these farmers and what you will be doing to restore the prices within the beef industry. I've listened to your answers from Pat and I'm still not getting any reassurance. In terms of supporting the prices, you know, certainly what our what our industry I suppose commissions us to do as part of our, our service provision is to try and tell the story and promote the industry and the products of industry. We don't buy or sell beef. The, the, yeah. the processing industry will buy raw material from yeah. the farmers and then they'll sell the, the output from their, their factories. So we're not involved in that commercial yeah. element of it, but the services that we do is really to help the entire supply chain to make sure that it has, in the first instance, access to the best paying markets possible. Once it has access to those markets, how do we tell the story of our industry to make sure that preference is created in that marketplace for our products over somebody else's? So that's a big part of what we do on quality assurance, about telling the story of our product, etc. And then once you're in those markets, it's about maintaining your share of those markets or potentially growing your share of those markets. So within the UK, we operate a, I suppose, a partnership agreement with Red Tractor, Red Tractor Assurance, if, if you're ever... Uh, across the across the water, you'll you'll see it here as well, and our and our supermarkets here as well, and a lot of products. You know, it's considered, I suppose, a, a premium sort of brand or a premium quality market uh, mark in the UK market, and there's a lot of effort and investment and focus going in to try and make sure that consumers are aware of the standards of our product. That if they have if they're faced with a choice of a, a product from. Um, Uruguay or Argentina or the USA or, or somewhere else that they'll choose our product over that, you know, for all of the reasons that we try to tell the story of. Um, I would love more money to be coming into the value chain and to the, the farming sector um, and the processing sector because it's always, it's such a globally competitive sector. We operate in a globally competitive market. Um, it's very difficult for people to generate sufficient revenue from that. 2019 was a very, very difficult year, and as you rightly say, prices were better in 17 and 18. You know, there were calculations last year. You know, certainly from a Northern Ireland perspective, that you know there was less. You know, farmers, you know, received less than 30 million. Or sorry, it was more than 30 million pound lost to the revenue of beef and sheep farmers last year because of the downturn in markets. That's a huge impact. You know, there's very few businesses could sustain that 25 percent reduction in income. And just expect to take it on the chin, you know that's a that's a huge issue for the farming industry to manage that volatility, uh, and I suppose that's one of the I suppose the considerations that's going forward as well. How do you manage that volatility within within supply chains to make sure that the supply base doesn't disappear? Because um, you know it has been a feature of all of our agricultural sectors over this last ten to fifteen years. You know there was huge volatility in the dairy industry. You know milk prices were well below the cost of production. Beef and sheep meat prices, unfortunately, are on, on most and a lot of years, I think if you look at the last 10 years, probably seven or eight of them, you know, have been below the cost of production. That, unfortunately, has been a, a feature of beef and sheep meat production and, and, and is why agricultural support is so important to that sector. Um, I don't have all the answers in terms of how we actually generate more revenue, but, you know, what everybody's doing at the minute is really to try and tell the story about our industry and, and push back and all the challenges that we're facing as an industry, not just from the market, but 
external challenges to do with things like climate change, to do with the, you know, the whole veganuary, you know, and, and sort of changing diets, and, and, and certainly people, you know, choosing to eat less meat, eat less red meat, um, things like market access, all of these things all play a part. So we're involved in all of those areas. Um, I know I'm giving you a fairly convoluted answer, but in terms of trying to support farmers and prices, you know, I suppose that's, those are the sort of spaces that we're working in to try and create preference in the market and to try and create as much sort of, I suppose, demand for a product as possible. Yeah, no, there's still such a discrepancy between what the producer receives and what the housewife is buying it at. And the producer's prices are not going up and certainly meat on our shelves and the shelves in the supermarket is not coming down. And it's that discrepancy that I think, again, needs to be looked at somewhere. I don't know who looks at it or who tries to investigate it, but that, okay. that is a big problem. And just one other question. In relation to livestock uh, genetic improvement uh, initiatives, do you think that there's potential in this initiative to breed TB-resistant cattle? I'm from, an, I'm from a, a rural area, I represent a rural area, and we've got quite a bit of TB. So, your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, certainly t TB is a, a huge issue for our industry here in Northern Ireland, and, and certainly, you know, as we move forward into a new sort of operating environment post-Brexit, it probably brings it more to the fore than, than, than ever, because a lot of the international markets that we supply into, you know, TB is not something, you know, that... Uh, is something to shout about in terms of our, 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 I suppose, our position here in Northern Ireland. We want to see TB eradicated, uh, and that's not going to be an easy task. Um, so, one of the areas I, I know certainly there there are um, there are genetics that um, animals are known to be less susceptible to TB. You know, so it, you know, an atriate can effectively be introduced into a breeding a breeding cycle. Um, but I suppose it's probably not one of the most, I suppose, it's, it's not top of the priority list in terms of genetic improvement. Um, big challenge we have in, in Northern Ireland and beef and cheap meat industry is actually getting people to, to consider genetic improvement per se, because a lot of them don't actually measure or monitor performance or use performance recorded animals or, or look at the type of genetics they're using. So it's actually getting people to change their mindset and think about how they actually improve the genetics. Um, I know certainly there are countries that have been, been focusing on you know, TB as, as one of the, uh, the breeding parameters, so it is in there in terms of the list of traits that you can select for, but I suppose if somebody's looking at the selection traits of an animal, they're maybe looking at growth rate, you know, they're looking at calving interval, they're looking at how easy the animal is to calve, etc. Those things probably all come slightly ahead of, maybe you might have an animal that does well in terms of you know, TB resistance, but it might not be very good in terms of its overall performance. So it's, it's, it's measuring all those things in the round. Um, I certainly have been at conferences where, you know, technologies that we don't use in the UK currently. You know, I was at an international conference where, you know, it was a very highly technical presentation on gene editing. You know, things like gene editing, you can do things that can actually switch off animals' resist, you know, susceptibility to certain things. These are sort of technologies that probably in coming years will become much more important to the fore to try and help solve challenges like this, because it's a, it's a huge challenge for everybody you know, to get rid of TB. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claire. Thank you, Chair, and nice to meet you. Thanks very much, and thanks for the briefing paper. It was some good stuff in there. Um, but I maybe want to come back and ask a few. We questions on different areas uh, when in your um paragraph on, on climate change um i absolutely agree i think that agriculture as well um while it is seen as part of the problem it also is part of the problem so it's not just about being seen we know um and i think that it can be a huge driver in being um, part of the solution uh, and we need to step up to that one but um you state then that if uk policy was to simply reduce production, this simply exports the problem, which I don't really understand. Um, and then I've gone on, science and policy instruments must be used to support sustainable development of the local beef and sheep sectors. Um, 
if maybe tell us about that policy, what, what kind of policy would you like to see coming forward there? And that this is not only a challenge for policy, but for the industry to prevent consumers from changing eating habits and moving away from beef and lamb due to mistruths or confusing commentary. If you could let us know what, what you would identify as that. And going back, I know Rosemary's mentioned um, TB there, and under your bit on animal health, you go on to say that it's obviously it's a, it is a long-running and challenging disease. Um, but then saying that that it will only have a very limited influence on the industry's capacity to capitalise on future trade opportunities in countries such as China. Um, and that's set to open up for the UK market with Brexit. I'm wondering how you think we could maybe marry this increased production for example, the Chinese market, with our existing climate commitments, including ammonia reductions that are all in the human health and well-being. And I do have to come back to the ammonia. And I know that you made mention of it before, but I need to go a wee bit more. You're even stating here that approximately 94% of NI emissions are from the agriculture sector. And I think that matches well with the departments. I think they're saying 96%. Um, but you're saying that it's recognised. Oh, yeah, maybe if you could talk, tell us how, why we're so high and why we're such an outlier compared to the rest of the UK. I know that we spike in emissions here in Northern Ireland, and you're saying that our emissions have even reduced mm -hmm. since their peak in '98, which I'm sort of we're sitting at 94 to 96 percent at the minute. What were they at their peak in '98? Um, and while we've reduced, you admit we've increased again in recent years. Um, and it's recognised that action is required by local far farmers to tackle ammonia emissions and improve air quality and habitats. However, credit must be given for existing mitigation work. And I would like to tease a wee bit more idea about what is that existing mitigation work and how do you work with the department? Um, and if you are working with the department, um, are we making sure that any future projects and practices um, with ammonia in particular are legally proofed, particularly given uh, or following the 2017 High Court ruling against the Secretary of State, I think, for communities it was? There's quite a bit in that question. Yep. <laughs> I'm not allowed to come back, you see, so get it all out one. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for your briefing, Claire. <laughs> if I could just pick up your, your, your very initial um, question, Claire, and, and, and Ian, um, I've been writing copious notes beside me here, so hopefully he can, he can answer some of the other stuff. But, the, the commentary around sort of exporting the problem, for want of a better word, I suppose one of the concerns that industry has is that in terms of social media space in particular, in terms of a lot of the commentary that's out there, quite often the problems that are perceived around agriculture, particularly around um, uh, beef production, um, are not necessarily reflective of the industry here in, in, in Northern Ireland, being a, a, a essentially a grass-fed uh, industry here. I think some of the concerns we would have would be that if future agricultural policies do, do not allow for the support of our industry here, and if trade policies are ultimately veering us towards um, importing more cheap cheap food, ultimately what happens is, is that production moves from here to other parts of the planet. Um, I think in particular, he heading west to the Americas, the South Americas. I think some of the concerns we would have is that quite often people um, have a, a specific perception of farming, which is based on practices that don't necessarily happen here. So I think that's one of our concerns generally is, is that we have a very um, uh, high quality industry here, which meets very high quality in terms of animal health and welfare, and in terms of, of environment as well, in terms of, um, uh, of, of, of mitigation. A lot more can be done here, and we accept that, and I suppose that's one of our, our challenges. But our concern would be that if in the round uh, these policies ultimately end up in reducing the potential to produce here, um, that production has to happen somewhere else. And in actual fact, we're exporting the problem and probably importing the problem as well. Rather than changing eating habits? <laughs> well, I, I, I suppose yeah, there are so many challenges around eating habits, and, and we're very much um, aware, aware of that, particularly around veganism, around flexitarianism and so on. But in our view, there's still very much room for um, good quality, in our case, farm quality assured beef and lamb on, on the plate and reducing considerably or eradicating that we don't believe is good for the individual, health of the individual, as much as we don't believe is good for the, uh, the health of the environment as well. But maybe I'll let you had a lot more after yeah. that, and maybe let Ian pick some of that up as well. Yeah, well, certainly in terms of, Jared, uh, you've, you've dealt with the, the exporting the problem. Um, I suppose some of the, the other issues you, you flagged up there in terms of 
you know, new markets and, and managing, you know, the sort of the conundrum of increasing production. Um, I guess we would we would make the argument here in Northern Ireland, and there's been various studies done, um, like the Sustainable Land Management Strategy was one which was done sort of looking at the productive potential here in Northern Ireland. About 95% of our of our, our agricultural land is grassland. You know, it's not easily you know turned over to something else. You know, given the the type of land that we have, the size of our farms, and also the climate. You know, we, we, we're not particularly. Um, adept at producing anything other than, than producing milk or meat off grass. You know, that's that's what we do and we do it well here in this region. And we've got the I suppose the resource to do it. You know, we're not um, you know, we're not we're not working with scarce water resources here in Northern Ireland. You know, we we do have the the farming systems that can convert land, which otherwise would just be abandoned. Is it better to use land to its productive potential and produce something that can help generate um, food for the population? Or is it better to just let it go idle? You know, certainly, or, or convert it to forestry. It's not something that our industry wants to wants to see happening. So, in terms of managing that production, we need to do it sustainably. So, you know, in terms of the the focus of industry and government has been how do we actually produce to the most efficient way possible. So that's getting all the things right in terms of animal health, in terms of genetics, in terms of husbandry, in terms of food conversion efficiency of our animals, etc. So it's about doing it. Um, as efficiently as possible and as effectively as possible. So the policies you talked about in terms of supporting the industry, that's where we see that the focus should be in terms of how do we drive productivity, how do we make our farmers more resilient, how do we make sure that they get the right knowledge and innovations you know, that can allow them to do that. So, so whether it's tackling production issues, whether it's tackling the environmental issues, which is a key factor going forward. You know, our farming industry you know, certainly... You know, when they hear so much information being, you know, I suppose carried in, in media circles that our farmers are destroying the environment, it couldn't be farther from the truth. You know, in terms of our environment wouldn't be what it is without our farmers. You know, in terms of our, our you know, the, the landscapes that people enjoy, the <coughs> recreational value they get out of our landscapes, you know, the water quality. You know, there's a lot of, you know, farmers put a, a huge amount of time, effort and investment into managing their business in an environmentally sustainable way. So... How can they get incentivised for doing things even better? You know, that's a big part of the, the challenge going forward. What you talked about in terms of ammonia, you know, we have been part of the, I suppose, industry working group that has been, been discussing with DERA around a future sort of ammonia action plan. I know that's to be, to be consulted on uh, at some point in the, in, in, in the near future. I think the industry recognises that ammonia is a major challenge. You know, um, the reason, like you said, we were an outlier, because of our... Um, our ruminant-based production systems. That's probably why we're such an outlier. But that's that's the nature of our farming systems here. We can't really convert our land to anything else. So how do we make those systems uh, that we have, you know, develop the right type of technologies on their farm to do it? You know, I know certainly there's been a lot of, of issues um, over recent months in terms of farmers not being able to put in new investments and, and business development actually that could reduce their ammonia outputs you know, because of planning constraints and things like that. So that there's, a, there's a whole sort of issue around that in terms of how can farmers actually you know, replace old buildings and, and adopt new technologies that will actually help deal with the ammonia issue. A big part of uh, ammonia, where it comes from, is in the mixing of, of, of dung and urine. So you know, if we can extend the grazing season, that's easier said than done in a climate like ours. You know, th those are those are those are sort of issues. But where you've got intensive indoor type systems, you know, then there are technologies that can be used to reduce the, the ammonia emissions from those. So whether that's covering slurry stores, whether it's using low emission spreading techniques, whether it's using additives to reduce the ammonia, etc. Those those are all sorts of things that are being discussed, and, and presumably the department will consult on as part of its ammonia action plan going forward but I think the industry recognises the challenges of ammonia uh, and you know we're certainly up for the challenge but certainly we can't be in a situation where industry is actually impeded from becoming more productive and more efficient you know through I suppose very onerous regulations that, that don't necessarily achieve the outcome that, that everybody wants um, so it's, it's a big challenge you know uh, Everything we've talked about today, you can see there's a lot of challenges, you know, facing our industry going forward. And ammonia, ammonia, certainly, I've heard that said. If we if we weren't talking about Brexit last year, that's the only thing we'd have been talking about because yeah. it was the next big issue.
and, and is a big issue for the industry. There's no no question. Um, but you know, certainly speaking to our industry participants, they're they're up for the challenge, providing they can get the right levels of support and, and technical support to, to do the the things that they need to do to try and reduce our our, our impact on the environment. Because you know, it is a challenge. You know, I don't, I don't think the industry would would bear its head in the sand and say that ammonia is not a problem because it is. But they're, they're up for. Um, trying to do what they can to, to help solve the problem. Are they complying with the current legal rulings? Well, certainly, you know, as, as an industry, um, you know, one thing you, you'll often hear from, from farmers is that, you know, we're good in Northern Ireland at gold plating regulations, and, and, and farmers certainly have been um, well adhering to the legislation over the years, you know, in terms of, we, we certainly find it as part of our, our voluntary farm quality assurance scheme, a lot of what we do as part of that on farm inspection is looking at farmers' compliance with certain regulations, and, and 99 times out of 100, you know, farmers are good at complying with the, the rule books, you know, that that they have to operate within. So we have a good level of compliance, and I guess a good, it's another good story about our industry. You know, whatever you're trying to sell yourself and make create preference in markets, you know, we do have a good level of compliance, uh, and we have good, um, you know. Our industry, you know, when they're talking to our customers, whether they're in Great Britain or farther afield, they do recognise, you know, that our industry you know, is good at meeting specifications, is good at complying with rules and regulations, you know, and a lot. That's what a lot of business is about these days, you know. So uh, I would say, you know, I certainly wouldn't criticise our farming industry for not following the rule book. Okay. Okay. It, Claire, um, John. <coughs> Chair, sure, thank you. you. Must have been saving the best to last for you. Um, <laughs> Chair, um, uh, a, a lot of what I what I uh, had to raise has been covered, not least of all by yourself when, when you opened with the questioning around uh, food standards and imports. But I would like to try and um, get some more detail on that if we can. So can, can I ask you? Uh, thank you first of all for being here to join others. And, Gratitude for your presentation, um, and also thank you for your perseverance during these uncertain times. On behalf of our, you know, major producers and, and uh, important sector, the at Westminster there, there's a uh, an amendment proposed to, to the agriculture bill. I think it's a proposed clause four on protection of food standards and imports by ensuring that any imports. Um, post EU exit would be at least um, off the standard we are currently used to, or above that standard. Is that a useful amendment? Is it something we should be looking at in the Northern Ireland Assembly to bring to here, to protect the standards uh, to which we have become accustomed, and also to protect the jobs mm -hmm. and industries that rely on those, those standards being adhered to? That's the first question. Secondly, I'll just do it, and I'm aware of the time here, in relation to, to the environmental concerns expressed previously. Do you, do you work with and through the uh, Sustainable Dairy Symposium um, and the work they're doing and looking at nationally and internationally? Maybe John, if I pick up the first, the first question, um, certainly the answer to your question will be yes. We, we do believe uh, it's vital that uh, we can maintain the food standards that, that, that we're accustomed to here. Said earlier on, we, we I referred to our, our our farm quality assurance scheme and the length that's been running, and that's that's a prize we don't want to lose, and certainly we wouldn't want to see um, um, as a result of any uh, future policies that being in any way diluted or being forced into competition with with lesser standards. And I think to be fair, and this it pops up in that the general public sometimes take for granted is the quality of the food that is produced here in the north of Ireland. I think sometimes we can take that for granted. Uh, 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 in many respects, in fact, unfortunately, some of these can be criticised unfairly. So I think cer certainly in, in, in terms of so continuing to support industry, we consider maintenance of food standards to be to be critical. And I think it's something that's it's a jewel in the crown here for us, and it's something we, do, we don't want to lose. Okay. On the Sustainable Dairy Symposium, I suppose as, as an organisation, our remit is, is beef and lamb, so we're not directly involved in that symposium, but I, I'm aware of the, the work of it. Um, through some of the international platforms that we're involved in, um, the European Roundtable for Beef Sustainability works quite closely with the International Dairy Federation and, and, and areas like sustainability. Because as a as a as a as a red meat industry, a lot of our raw material is coming from the dairy industry. So 
you know, we're seeing a lot more dairy farmers taking an interest in the beef attributes of the animal that they're um, generating, you know, in terms of, you know, once they have, uh, I suppose, used, a lot of dairy farmers now are using, um, you know, sex semen to get the, you know, the right number of dairy herd replacements to replace their own dairy herd, but the, a big chunk of the, the beef animal or, or beef then is coming from the other cows in the dairy herd. So a lot of farmers are really focusing on the genetics they use for that. So. As part of the, I suppose the the evolution of the the red meat industry going forward, there there is more engagement now. There always was good engagement, but there's probably closer engagement now between the beef and dairy industries going forward in terms of making sure that you know we do work together on things like sustainability. You know because we're based with ruminant livestock systems or the same same types of might be generating different products, but the sustainability agenda is exactly the same. You know in terms of. Um, using our grass as efficiently as possible to produce sort of high value protein as efficiently as possible. So um, we do work closely with the dairy industry on a number of, of areas. So um, I, I, I certainly was at they had a, like they had a sustainable dairy symposium in Greenmount not that long ago. I was at that, you know, so where, where they were presenting some of the, the work they've been doing. So there's, there's the sectors are tied up then. The sectors are tied up because there's, 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 a, there's a, lot of, a lot of crossover between the sectors, you know, particularly around the whole area of dairy origin beef because that's becoming such an important raw material now for industry. As unfortunately, we've seen the numbers of suckler cows reducing, you know, the number of dairy cows have stayed relatively stable. But certainly, um, the dairy farmers and, and some of the dairy processors and some of our beef processors are even now working closer together to try and make sure that the right type of genetics are being used to generate, you know, a more efficient beef animal that best meets the market specifications. So, and on sure going back to this, and uh, before we close this, the the uh, the protection of food standards that that their, their attempts to secure investments are currently now. That will depend, of course, on, on the arithmetic there and wood here also. But, but so they were clear, that would be a useful tool to try and protect, first of all, our standards and our industry and something. In summary, do, do you think that one do you know, ask you to protect the future? Is it something this assembly should be looking at directly? Well, certainly, um, we do believe it, it would be very important, and I think that the, this body can do to help support and further the interests of our, our red meat industry, we would be quite supportive of that. Thank you. Um, See, so just picking up just something that, uh, that John had just mentioned there a minute ago in relation to the minimum food standards. Um, what's your understanding in terms of the Irish protocol? Um, obviously, that commits us to continue with EU regulations and directives in regards to a whole range of issues. Would the protocol um, create that baseline of minimum food standards for here? You know, certainly, my, my understanding certainly as part of the, the protocol is that we, we will be much more closely aligned with the, the standards at the EU. Um, you know, our industry, I suppose, has become quite familiar to operating to those standards. You know, I don't think, you know, whilst early on in the days of suppose, some of the Brexit discussions, I think some people talked about having a bonfire regulation and we going to scrap all standards. I think that, that was never going to be the case. Um, you know, as an industry, we've actually developed the professional industry that we have, the credibility for our products and the quality of our products. They're all based on standards. You know, when we go to market and promote our industry, we're promoting the standards that our industry operates to. If you don't have those standards, then it's very hard to promote an industry. Um, you know, how do you create preference if you're not operating to a certain level of, of high standards? And those standards are well recognised internationally in the markets that, that we operate within. So going forward, the, the big concern of industry is, you know, what happens in GB if GB certainly decides to reduce standards in certain area, but we're maybe operating to slightly higher standards. You know, if there is divergence in certain areas, you know, how does that play out in terms of, you know, we've been told we're going to have unfettered access to the GB market, and I would like to think that will continue to be the case. But if, we, if there is to be, if divergence in standards starts to appear going forward, you know, just how that's all going to play out in practice. But, you know, certainly if the UK, the UK might decide to move ahead in certain standards, you know, how does that play out for us? So if, if GB, for example, decides to ban the live export of animals, you know, how does that play out in Northern Ireland? You know, we have a big issue in terms of live exports to the Republic of Ireland. You know, 
you know, how do these things sort of play out in practice? You know, we certainly wouldn't want to see that's an important part of our trade. So how, how do those things uh, play out and, and, and on the ground? And I suppose that's that's going to be some of the things this joint committee and specialised committee is going to have to try and get its head around going forward, how these things actually will, will play out in practice on the ground. But certainly as an industry, we want to maintain standards. You know, in GB, our industry wants to maintain standards. They're making a huge issue of of the standards that we operate to and that you know there isn't an undermining of that. I know there was to think the farming organisations were planning to have a major rally in the next couple of weeks. I think they've suspended that now just because of coronavirus. But it's, big, it's such an important issue that we're planning a fairly significant rally in Westminster to really try and elevate the importance of this issue. So you know I think it was a key focus of discussion at the NFU's conference in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago. With the whole area of standards is, is one that really is to the, the forefront of, of the industry's minds at the moment. So um, certainly whatever... What, Obviously, trade's not a, a devolved matter, but as much influence as we can make in Westminster to try and make sure that we're not undermined when it comes to some of these international deals, the better, you know, as far as I would say. Um, no doubt uh, the, the, um, the foreign community welcome the fact that the, the red diesel wasn't in the firing line in yesterday's <laughs> budget. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> Uh, William was trying to persuade me as to that, but me so you're right. <laughs> That's okay, <isn't> William. <laughs> um, we we'll have two more to come in. Uh, uh, come back in, uh, Pat and William. Pat, and, uh, William. That's it. That. No, I'm I'm okay. Oh, sure, okay. everything was, was, was answered, answered there for me. Thank you. Sorry about that, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the issue of ammonia emissions has been mentioned, and I fully understand the, the concern there is and, and the necessity to deal with that. But would you accept that there are ways? Uh, and we know that there, there are ways been looked at that can greatly reduce ammonia emissions. For instance, the spread of sorry, but spread plate. I think trail and shoe reduces those emissions by something like forty percent. Mm -hmm. But I think there there are ways that the industry can reduce emissions. I think it's a big challenge for the industry, and I think it's a big investment for many farms. And I think the necessity it necessitates <coughs> to help them do that. Absolutely, and, and certainly as, as an industry, you know, the time, whenever the nitrates director came in, that was a huge issue for the industry, but the industry played its part. You know, there was significant support made available from government to help the industry put in place the necessary investment to deal with that issue, and the industry responded very positively to that, you know, in terms of putting in tanks and dealing with the closed plates and things like that. So, you know, that, that is, as I think, um, as Claire mentioned, you know, farmers adhering to standards, you know, I think farming industry responded extremely well to that and, and does adhere to those requirements very stringently. So when it comes to money and the development of this new action plan that the department is working on, certainly, you know, if there are going to be significant investments that farmers have to put in place to, to make a real difference when it comes to money, you know, certainly I think the industry will be keen to see support arrangements in place to help them. Low emission spreading techniques is, is probably one of the things that has had the biggest uptake, but you know, if we're going to have to have more of that technology adopted on farms, it's going to require a big investment of, you know, in, in that type of infrastructure, either by contractors or by individual farmers, and that equipment is expensive. I'm also um, aware of new technology in America that we can reduce big time by taking the liquids uh, out of the manure and, and leaving solids, and it, it reduces, I think, massively. Uh, the, the mission. So there are technologies that are available, you know, that can make a difference. And, uh. well, look, and, and certainly, you know, one of one of the issues that certainly, I suppose, has has caused, you know, I think they've had some of these issues in the continent for quite a number of years in Holland and, and areas like that, and how they deal with some of the things is, you know, through a certification of slurry, you know. It's a, it's, a, it's a big issue from a health and safety perspective in Northern Ireland if you're trying to you know, put sulfuric acid into slurry to reduce ammonia release. You know, there are things like that. There are technologies that can be used, but are they the right technologies? That's right. And then you know, if you acidify slurry, our soils are already quite acidic. Do we want to acidify our soils even more and make them even less productive? So yeah. it's making sure that we get the right technology that doesn't have unintended consequences further down the line. So all of these things have to be weighed up as part of any sort of, I suppose, impact assessment, you know, in terms of what's the right technologies. But low emission spreading technique certainly helps solve two issues. It helps on the greenhouse gas side and it helps on ammonia as well. So getting things that, that tick more than one box and, and help. Yeah.
I'll just move over briefly into Rosemary. Yeah, just sorry, one one quick question on coronavirus. Or, um, how have you any thoughts on how the if there was to be a partial lockdown in respect of marks, how they would sh or should attempt to deal with it? Well, I, I guess any, any business will, will take its, its lead from the, the advice that's given by the, the authorities. You know, I, um, I know certainly back in the days of, of foot and mouse, you know, there, there, were, there were other sort of alternative arrangements put in place at that time. There was people that, that operated video sales, for example. There were, there were things that, depending on how long this lockdown would be for, you know, I think, you know, any sort of lockdown when you've got live animals in a system that, that come ready for finish, you know, they need to be moved, you know, it's not, it's not like something you can suddenly, you know, livestock do need, you know, they're on a growth pattern, have to be supplied into a supply chain. So, you know, it, it's very difficult to lock down a system that requires sort of almost just in time movements, you know, whenever an animal is ready for moving to slaughter, you know, you need to get it away, you know, otherwise it becomes out of spec. You know, livestock markets play an important role in our industry in establishing prices and given the transparency you talked about earlier. That's that's one of the key areas that farmers can sort of, I suppose, measure against the, the, the value they're getting if they take them direct for slaughter. You know, um, livestock markets play a hugely important role in our industry in terms of giving that level of price transparency and giving farmers, I suppose, competition. Um, so, you know, I hope we're not there yet in terms of that lockdown, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert when it comes to coronavirus, but you know, we, we'll certainly as an industry take our lead from the, the, the authorities. You know, so. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And Claire? Thank you. Just a quick follow-up one again, just on the, techn the technological um, solutions for reducing ammonia. Um, well, of course, that is a factor. What outside of technology is being done or discussed? Are we talking about reducing livestock numbers, for example, reducing um, the intensification of farming, or are we simply looking to technology to solve this? It's one of those issues, certainly, you know, um, whenever some of the, the, the early sort of workshops, whenever government and industry got together to think about what, what's the potential solutions for the ammonia situation. I don't think there's anybody within our agricultural industry wants to see you know, a policy that leads to the reduction of livestock numbers because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we probably don't use our land to its proper potential here now that we can grow a lot more grass than we do. Um, you know, we're not certainly um, saying that we need to double our livestock numbers in Northern Ireland, but in terms of sustaining what we have, there's a critical mass of livestock, you know, that uh, we need to maintain in terms of the the output of our industry in terms of managing the landscape, etc. You know, if we if we lose our livestock off big parts of our land, then the land just becomes barren, which which doesn't you know deliver a lot of good in terms of the environmental or biodiversity or, or, or sequestration of carbon and any of those things. So we need to try and make sure that you know the technologies and the the, the policy instruments that come out of this action plan can be adopted at farm level. You know, and and, and certainly. You know, we wouldn't be advocating as part of that that reduction of livestock numbers as part of that policy. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, the, you know, if anything to say, our, our industry has the capacity to produce more livestock and do it a lot more efficiently than other parts of the world. You know, there is a growing demand for for meat and milk around the world. Certainly, our belief we should be doing it in those areas that can do it as efficiently and sustainably as possible, and we think we're one of those regions. We've got a challenge with ammonia, there's no doubt about that, but I, I think technology and um, investment can help overcome a lot of those challenges. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and just finally, finally, um, we, the committee are starting to look at uh, what be our strategic priorities in the time ahead. So from your perspective, what do you believe should be uh, amongst or the perhaps the most or amongst the, the most uh, important strategic projects that you believe that we should be focusing on in the time ahead? Um, well, certainly in terms of the, I suppose a lot of the, the issues we discussed today, I think are you know are, are right to the fore at the moment. You know, certainly in terms of the, the future agricultural policy in Northern Ireland, I think certainly you know has to be right up there. It's it's. It's one of the few things that we we have a, a you know we have the regional flexibility to tailor 
agricultural policy to the needs of our industry here in Northern Ireland and to the needs of, of, of government and, and the environment sector. So you know, that, that certainly is a, is a key piece of work. You know, TB certainly is one of those areas we need to make progress on TB. That is certainly one of the big issues that generates a lot of a lot of waste in our industry. It generates a lot of cost to government. It generates, you know, a lot of hardship for those people, and it, it, it will have an impact on our ability to service some export markets going forward. I've no no doubt about that. You know, so it's a, it's a key issue. I think we need to really try and get a, a handle on. Um, a lot of the other things we talked about today. Um, you know, are, are right up there. You know, in terms of, you know, what this Brexit, what the protocol is going to look like in terms of how, how Northern Ireland, you know, operates going forward. Because, you know, there are concerns in terms of this sort of frictionless trade, and if we don't end up with a, a trade deal with the European Union, you know, where where does that leave us in terms of um, our, our our ability to, uh, I suppose, um, generate the market returns that our, that our industry needs. I know our industry has a huge issue when it comes to labour. You know, as part of the uh, Migration Advisory Committee, the new immigration policy is a huge issue for a particular processing industry, where maybe 65 to 70 percent of the employees are non-UK nationals. You know, where's the, you know, where's the the, the labour to support that industry, that economic driver of our economy? Where's it going to come from in the future? Big issue. Climate change is a huge issue. It's not going to go away. You know, how do we how do we make sure that what we're doing here in Northern Ireland we're playing our part in that? Um, you know, those are all those are all areas. You know, in terms of you know, the, 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 there are big headline issues that that, that we certainly have a, an active involvement in, in terms of trying to, to play our part. I suppose, Chairman, the one last comment I'd make is I think one thing that we don't do particularly well here in Northern Ireland is we're not good at telling our story. And we firmly believe that uh, agriculture in particular, the sector we represent, has a very good story to tell. Uh, and I believe there's a lot more can be done in terms of uh, joining up um, industry, government and other, and other players as well in terms of getting that message out to the wider public. In particular, challenging some of the myths that are out there are, are, are around the sector and a lot of the issues that we discussed earlier on here. We think a lot more could be done by helping to join those dots together. Um, if I was to criticise ourselves generally within the industry and within our own media, we tend to talk to ourselves a lot. I think we need to be getting a message that, particularly to the younger generation, many of whom might be a bit more further removed from uh, from uh, the, the rural life than most of us sitting in this room are. So I think there's a big challenge there um, for ourselves, for this committee, indeed for, uh, for, for, for government as well. Very much, Chair. I can identify that. I was, a, I was in an event recently. Uh, and there was younger people there, and I started just randomly talking about pillar one, pillar two, and they go, "Hang on, what, what, what are you talking about?" <laughs> so I think it is important <laughs> that we sort of get out of the bubble and sort of realise it. You know. So listen, um, Jared and Ian, very comprehensive briefing and very comprehensive range of answers as well. And we really appreciate that. That's been very, very informative and helpful, helpful for the committee. And no doubt we'll be drawing on your your experience and on your information in the time ahead. So thank you very much for attending here this morning. And thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members, for listening to us. Thank you. Um, sorry, um, we will be shortly. We're going to just do. We're going to do A O B and then we'll do a closed session. The message is coming. You should look at your phone from the. <laughs> I don't have the phone. No, but I'm just. I will be scurrying here, but. We're going. We're going into closed session in about two minutes. Right. Okay. Let me look at my phone. So you're going okay. To seven, uh, right. Do members have any other items? No. Do members have any other items of business they'd like to raise? No. The next meeting is Thursday, 19th of March at 10 a.m. in room 30. Mm -hmm. Now we'll move into closed session now for the remainder of the meeting to consider evidence and key issues for consideration on the UK Agriculture Bill. We need to clear the public. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.